first ab about me, some words. My name is Gerrit Grunwald. I'm working for a company in Switzerland, living in Germany. Studied physics, never learned programming somewhere in school or university. Everything I know, I learned by myself. Um, at some point, I stumbled upon Java. Then, a bit later, somewhere, I became Java champion, founded the Java user group, and mainly doing UI stuff. So I'm a graphics freak. That, that's true. Um, and today, I would like to talk about Java on desktop and why it is not, hopefully, not that yet. So first of all, let me go back to 2012, where there was a statement that I found very interesting, which was, the desktop is dead, right? Future of application development is the web, right? So that, that's what they announced in 2012. I don't know where it was, at some con conference. And I thought, OK, never really thought about that. But to this year, seven years later, I thought it's time to recap. And if this is true, or this was true in 2012, then my application folder on my, on my Mac, it should probably look like this, or similar, or maybe even not an application a finder or something at all. Maybe it should be a Chromebook, and I only should have browsers where I can open websites and use my web applications, because the desktop is dead, right? We heard that in 2012. But if I take a look at my application folder, it looks like this. Lots of, lots of, lots of, lots of applications are in there. And maybe some of them using web technology running on the desktop, but most of them, I can promise, are native apps. So what does it mean, right? Hmm. Seems desktop is not dead. Um, by the way, I think all of you are programmers, developers, right? Who's using Eclipse? OK. IntelliJ? Right. NetBeans? NetBeans, yay. <laughs> Some web IDEs, someone? No web IDEs. How comes? Oh, there, one. I saw one. At least one. OK, so, and you know that this is Java desktop you are using, right? So it's a desktop application. OK, just I, I make this poll always because I'm interested in what people use. It seems it's always going IntelliJ these days. OK, but what about Java then? I mean, um, let's take a look at all the toolkits that we have available. And over oh yeah, here, there's this very old one, an abstract window toolkit. It's um, since 1995. It, it was part of Java 1, as I remember, right? It's cross-platform. It's platform dependent because it bounds to native controls. That means um, you can use it on, on every platform, but then, for example, a combo box on, on Windows looks different than a combo box on, on the Mac, and so that leads to some problems. It's more or less the interface to native controls. Um, and that's the oldest one of all. And to be honest, I would say this is dead. Is someone using AWT here or know of? Someone else who's using AWT? I don't think so. And then we have SWT, the standard window toolkit. And um, this is based on some IBM stuff from 1993. And it's also cross-platform. It's, again, platform dependent. It's a wrapper around native controls. Does someone here do Eclipse rich client platform applications, maybe? Nobody. Oh, that's interesting. Because this is Eclipse is running on SWT, more or less. I think this is the main driving part behind it at the moment. Because I know that some companies work with SWT, but this is also rich client platform applications based on Eclipse. And then there was Swing, which was a successor to AWT. Who's using Swing? Someone here in the audience? Ah, oh, a few. OK, still. OK, not too bad. I mean, it's old. OK, that's OK. No worries. <laughs> it's still great. It's still great. Um, it's cross-platform. And uh, Sun learned that these days um, it's platform independent. And it introduced look and fields. 
and also it, it emulates the appearance of native controls. <clears throat> that was the, the result of this bound to be nat to native controls in AWT, which really didn't work out for everything. So they introduced Swing, where you can build real cross-platform applications that have the same they have the same look and feel on each platform. <clears throat> that was fun. And then there came this guy. Who, does someone remember JavaFX script? Some? Okay. Yeah, it should have been the successor to Swing. That was the plan of Sun Microsoft. And it's based on F3, which was a form follows function. And I remember the days when it came up. Just don't know if it was Chris Oliver or someone else who invented it. And um, yeah, it's again cross-platform, platform independent. It has no Java syntax. It was it, like a mixture between, uh, it looked terrible to me, to be honest. It, it was just a, a new language. But it gave us a decla declarative way to describe UIs. And um, because Sun was looking for a successor to Swing, they just took the stuff of this guy who was working, not even for Sun at the time when he invented it, and then he named, they named it JavaFX script. Yay! And then it was the Sun way of developing things. They announced something. One year later, Java won. They announced something. Yeah. Most of the stuff never made it really to the, to the platform. But it's still there. There is a successor to JavaFX script. It has a different name, can't really remember. But it's still available. And then there was JavaFX. I mean, I'm probably, I'm sure you know all that. It's the official or was successor to Swing. It's, uh, it's in Java since Java 7, but it was never part of the JDK, right? <clears throat> Sometimes people get that wrong. It came as a bundled JRE, uh, bundled lib, uh, bundled to the JRE, and, and then it was deployed with the JDK, but it was not part of the JDK. It's also cross platform, it's platform independent. And it's more or less a part of the JavaFX script from the scripting language into Java. That took around one to two years for Oracle to port the stuff because they learned that um, developers are not happy with the JavaFX script language. So it was, and, and for me it was the same. I was not willing to learn a new language to describe the UI in Swing. <clears throat> I mean, today people learn every two months a new JavaScript framework without complain complaining, but at these days it was, um, that was a reason not to do it. And uh, it's not part of Java SE distribution since Java 11 anymore. So, but we will come to that later. And most of this stuff is still in use, so this is interesting. Is someone using JavaFX here in the room? One, two, three, uh, a few. Okay. <clears throat> So the question that I'm faced with quite often is, is JavaFX dead now? Now that it's not part of the JDK or not distributed with the JDK anymore. So let me give you some points. So it, it was open sourced quite early when they developed the stuff. That was a very smart move. And you can find the project on openjfx.io. And there's also a GitHub clone of the repository, so you can file bugs and all that. You can also participate, it's no problem. <clears throat> it's driven by the community, which sometimes sounds a bit like, okay, it's dead. Um, remember when Open, what was it, Open Office was kicked by Oracle, then it became LibreOffice. Someone used LibreOffice here? Still a few? Okay, that's great. Um, but it was somehow the impression was it was going down. It was not hyped anymore, right? But in this case, it was really a, a good for JavaFX that it was driven by the community or is driven by the community. Because now we don't have to <clears throat> go through all these things within Oracle to get something done. Uh, it can run on mobile devices using Gluon. Who, who knows Gluon? Someone? I will come to that later on. Um, and it can run on the web. That sounds a bit strange. Does someone know JPro? One? Oh, wow. Well, that might be interesting for you guys. And uh, yeah, it's actively developed and it's getting even new features. So uh, even yesterday, there was an announcement from Gluon, which is a company that also offers the mobile support, that they now um, create a new Gluon plugin for, for Gradle and Maven where you can build native applications using Graal VM, and then you don't need the JDK to run all that stuff anymore. It will be directly compiled into native code, 
<coughs> means the startup time is the same as with the real native app. But now let's come to the interesting parts. Where does Java on desktop suck? And it seems to suck, right? That's what people tell me all the time. Oh, by the way, who's using Java on desktop in general here? I mean, coding. <coughs> oh, just a few. And who's doing web? Whatever web. I don't care the framework. Just web. OK. Who's doing JavaScript all the day? What? Nobody? One. Who? What two? Wow. OK. Oh, that's me. Who does Java? OK. Kotlin? What else is Ruby? Python? Oh, OK. Great. Oh, OK. That's good. <coughs> Okay, let's go through, through some points. So there is definitely a lack of third-party controls when it comes to JavaFX. So in the swing days, we had tons of libraries for, for UI. In JavaFX days, it's like um, <coughs> JavaFX has a kind of a bad start because uh, Oracle first did the JavaFX script stuff, which sucked. And then they named the new thing JavaFX2. And everybody was like, what? Oh, not this stuff again. So um, yeah, that was a little bit of a problem. So there was not a big adoption in the, in the beginning. And uh, yeah, that leads to, to the fact that people don't uh, develop libraries because they think it's dead. So why should I do something? OK. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a problem. <clears throat> we have missing features in JavaFX. If you know the table view, but I just, just a couple of people use it, so the table view just sucks in JavaFX and sucks hard. So it's really terrible. And nobody's willing to do a new one because table views are really hard to implement. And the swing thing worked great, but in JavaFX they tried something different and ah, failed. Okay. Certificates. Who loves certificates? It's great, right? Ah, it's, uh, can, you can really have fun with this stuff. I remember a project in Singapore where it took us weeks to get that right in the enterprise with all the certificates and uh, security. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. But I think that's the same for web, so certificates is always not that funny. Mobile. Oh, who, who does mobile development here? Someone? Native mobile? Okay. Hybrid? Just a few. Okay. So, um, yeah, even though the Gluon stuff is great, it's not really on par with the current <coughs> mobile development stuff. So it's, um, it's, it's really not bad. You will see it later, but, but not the same, the same quality. Um, UI design tools. Um, in Swing Days, we had a couple of UI builders. For JavaFX, there's just one, which is... Mm, the scene builder, so-called scene builder, works, but yeah, not for everyone. It could be nice, but it's not. Um, oh yeah, that's a good point. Lack of Oracle support. That's how it feels like because you know, you all, I work for Oracle, so I know what I'm talking about. And they like to announce stuff like, "Yeah, that's the big new thing." The next year they say, "What? What was it? JavaFX? Ah, no, it's not part of the JDK anymore." Are we? We don't use it. Ah, it's get rid of it. So it's really like, it doesn't really feel that you have a good support from them. But it, there is still support, even if it's not visible to the outside. So yeah, it's just how it looks to the outside. Then look and feel. That, did somebody ever work with look and feels and swing and created their own look and feel? This is a pain in the ass. Sorry for the words, but it's really... Oh. It could, can look really awesome, but it takes years to get there. Really not easy. <clears throat> In JavaFX, it's, it's better, but yeah, we come to that later. OpenGL. Hmm, JavaFX doesn't really support or offer access to OpenGL. It uses OpenGL and DirectX, but you can't really access it directly from JavaFX. Not yet. There is a project going on from Tom Schindler. <clears throat> where it might be possible in the future, but it's not at the moment, not officially. OK, we all know that. Fat clients, <coughs> sorry, uh, are heavyweight. That's the way it is. You deliver the JDK the, or JRE and all that stuff. So it's, uh, you can end up with a quite big application. 
and also memory wise and CPU consumption could be high. It's not a big problem these days because we all have these powerful machines. But yeah, still, it, it's not nothing compared to a browser. But sometimes if you open Chrome and then you check it in the, in the system tools, then you wonder how much memory some websites consume. It's really like, what? It's in the gigabyte area. So it's really like amazing. Um, yeah, admin rights. Ah, on Windows, if you would like to install an app in, in enterprises or companies, you need to be an admin to install it. And that's usually not the case. It means you need to, to call the IT support to install it and all this. Yeah, it's a hassle. It's not really nice. Then we have costs. I mean, JavaScript frameworks are more or less free. <coughs> uh, the Gluon stuff is free if you would like to make it open source, and you have to live with the, with the pop-up screen. But if you would like to use it commercially, you have to pay. Same goes for JPro. And I, can, and I agree to this point because there are some people that make their living out of this product, so somehow they have to feed their families, right? So that's the reason why you have to pay for that stuff. But it's, it's a drawback. <clears throat> well, this is a big one. Who is a UI developer here in the room? One. One? That's all? Well, that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I say, right? It's really hard to find good UI developers. <laughs> that's a problem. Uh, it is. I know that from projects. Uh, updates. Oh, this is great. This is something where Java really sucks on the desktop, right? Updates. If you have to update your application, there's no standard process. On Mac, there is some kind of a standard that you can use, even in desktop applications. On Windows, it's different. Linux is different. So there's no standard. And then the big point deployment. This is what I always hear. Yeah, yeah but the deployment, the deployment, it sucks. You have to install it on each and every machine. Yes, that's true. How do you install your browser, by the way? Ah, same. Ah, OK. But OK, yeah, this is just, it's, a, it's an argument, and I agree to that. Compared to a web application, is yeah, it's just different. It's, it's harder. So that was enough sucking Java desktop. Let's go to the good parts, oh, finally. So where does Java on desktop shine? It's one platform, right? I can run it on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and iOS, Android, and Embedded, and on the web. It's one platform. I don't have to change. I don't have to have dependencies on Node.js or whatever, NPM modules. Or, it's just one thing. <clears throat> which is great. Doesn't look like that, but it is. And it just works, right? You get 90% of the stuff that you need UI-wise is already in the platform. You don't need a lot of third-party libraries, which is also a big benefit. Mm. It seems to look like I'm, I'm really the, the Java desktop guy, right? <clears throat> I am, but I also uh, do web, and I try different things when HTML5 came up years ago, I was totally into it and, and, and Canvas and yay, and I did a, so much Canvas stuff and I ported libraries from Swing to Canvas and I was totally into web. And then they came up with all these frameworks. And then at some point I stopped because it, it was just too much. I can't learn every two months a new framework. It's just not, not possible. So, um, and the problem with this stuff is I'm doing mainly custom controls, really custom stuff that, <clears throat> that is needed by customers. And uh, it's not that easy to implement in, in the web frameworks. I mean, it's possible, but hmm, it was easier for me to do it in a native app like a JavaFX app. <clears throat> Styling. We have CSS in JavaFX, and um, I can style an application very easily using it. Mm. That was a drawback in Swing where you have to create your look and feel. Now I can, because all UI controls in JavaFX are styled via CSS natively, so there's one style sheet, and you can just load your own styles, and then you can restyle the application <coughs> quite easily. So it's very easy for us, and when I say for us, I mean the company. We have a lot of projects for Java desktop, and most of the times it's like enterprises. They come to us, and then they ask, okay, uh, it should look like this because this is all CI. Is it possible? No problem. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so the, you can do that. 
because it, you can create native applications, you are not bound to the browser frame, right? So if you have a, a, a web application, the browser is your screen, more or less. Means you can't get out of that, really, and you can't shape it. I mean, this is not really for everyone, but you can create irregular shaped windows with JavaFX, for example. There's no problem. Even with Swing, that was possible. For some people, this is important, not for everyone. It's really good for complex applications, like handling large data for visualization. I have a, a good friend who worked, worked for NASA, not anymore. They have this um, application for creating its trajectories for, for space flights, <clears throat> and they have to calculate tons of data to do that, millions of data points, and visualize them live, and click there, and do something, and it works, and this is JavaFX, so it, this is possible, and they, they choose it because the web was not able to do that at that time, I have to say at that time, maybe today, I don't know, but it's, it's very good in that. You stay on the same platform, which is for me the biggest benefit. That means if you're a Java shop, then you have all the Java knowledge. <coughs> all your developers are Java developers, more or less. It means you can use the same IDEs, the same test frameworks, the same build tools, the same deployment procedures, or deployment not, the same uh, dependency management, sorry. On the server and on the client, you can reuse code and libraries, right? You can write on the server side, you use the library, you use it on the, on the client side too, it's no problem, it works. This is something that is that Angular is trying to do now, right? Using native script, they finally try to share code because this is just a big benefit. It saves a lot of time. A lot of time means a lot of money. So if you are really have uh, projects where you have a fixed price and you have a given time, <coughs> this, is, this is much easier than doing a web framework where you have to redo everything again. Concurrency, yeah, that's well supported on, on Java. You all know that. And what is uh, valid for the, for the servers, also valid for the client, because it's the same platform. We, you can access native APIs. I mean, did someone do JNI or JNA here in the room? <coughs> it's not that easy, right? But it works. It should be better with Project Panama in the future. But at the moment, uh, JNI and JNA, it's, it's okay, Java Native Access, or Java Native Interface, for those who don't know it, um, makes it possible to really access some C code from the operating system if needed, so which is quite nice. We have drag and drop between Windows, file system, desktop, and so on. This is given, and not a problem, it just works. Network programming in general is no problem in Java, you know that. And this is, I, I mean, it's, it's for all the stuff is the same. When it, if it works on the server and you know all the server-side stuff, then the, most of the stuff works also on the client. There's no big problem with this. Internationalization, it's always for, for UI projects, for international customers, you need to switch the language. It's, it's not a big deal. It's, it's just, um, if you know how to do it, it's easy and it's not hard. You will find descriptions a lot on the web. Offline capability, sure, you can run a desktop application always, even without internet connection. You can do with a web application, part of. Not that easy, but it's possible. But it takes more effort to do that. Um, hardware acceleration, which is also true for web applications. Um, but we also have that in JavaFX, so that means you can hardware accelerated graphics you can uh, use for visualization research data and so on. Ah, this is the interesting part. It runs on mobile, natively, on desktop and on embedded, which is also not given for all the JavaScript stuff. Um, it runs on the web, in the browser, and I will show it to you. Might be really interesting for you. And we have stable APIs, which is the biggest thing ever. I mean, uh, it prevents you from really new features all the time, <clears throat> but um, it leads to a really good application life cycle. If you go to the enterprise world, what you usually find is they, they would like to have an application that runs for years, not for months. They need it to run for 10 years or something like that. It's, like I said, this is really for big companies, not for small ones, but this is usually what we see if we take a look at the web framework development stuff. 
you have frameworks, then another one, the, the one is at the highest, then the next one comes up, and so on and so on and so on. So the life cycle of your application is really bound to the <coughs> life cycle of the libraries, where a, a desktop application could look like this, the life cycle. And it does. I mean, we have a customer in Canada, he uses the software for 15 years. It's in the oil and gas industry. Same code still works. They do have sometimes, when, with the new JDK, they have to do some modifications, but it's slightly, but it's still the same and it works and they use it on a daily basis. So just keep that in mind, right? And typical environments for, for Java desktop is um, for sure something like insurance companies, banks, of course, um, industry in general, scientific uh, institutes, they use a lot of that. CERN, you might know, they use Java Desktop a lot. Military, and I was lucky to meet some people from the US military at Java 1 a couple of years ago, and they are allowed to talk about some stuff. And they just told us that it's, there's heavy use for that in military. I didn't know that. <coughs> So that was interesting. Then uh, trading companies use it a lot. Aviation, space and defense, like uh, Airbus, medical companies, and automotive. Do you know that Volkswagen, it's, it's huge. And on all Volkswagen cars and all the companies that belong to Volkswagen, the displays that you see in the cars are running Java. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm not sure if it's still these days, but as far as I know, it's still. It's not Swing and it's uh, Java 1.4. They built their own OpenGL um, toolkit to draw it. But all these things that you see in Porsche and all that, this, this is Java running in the, in the media stuff, right? Which is, which is fascinating when you see that and you see, oh, I didn't know that. Right, so, um, yeah, who's using it? I just picked a few, <coughs> like, you know, IntelliJ, NetBeans, Eclipse. Zeiss, Quintic is a company from the Netherlands, Nevis, Airbus, it's Audi, a lot of companies and even big ones like IBM, Microsoft, BMW, NASA, uh, Emirates Airlines, they, they use uh, Java desktop applications a lot. And if the, these companies use it, then the question is, um, how can someone claim that Java on desktop is dead? It's, I mean, there is a use case for that, and um, yeah, and this is not all. This is there are many more, right? But that means in the end, Java on desktop uh, is not dead yet. So that's for sure. I mean, I, I see that every day, but maybe this is not because it's not hyped anymore. People think, ah, oh, this is the old stuff. Nobody uses it, but it's it's really used quite often. And the question is, why is it not taken into account? Why don't people talk about it or, or don't even think about using Java Desktop? And um, one of the reasons that I think is it's a hype-driven development. Uh, this is what these days happen quite often. You, you, there is a new framework. You see people on conferences like these talking about the new latest shit. It's so great. Look at it. What you can do. Wow. And people in the audience coming back to the companies. Wow, I saw that. This is great. Let's try. So what happens? New project comes in. First thing, <clears throat> let's make a design decision. We use Angular 8. It's not out yet, but we use it anyway. It's great. OK, cool. And then we solve the problem. Ah, perfect. That's how it works. I, I saw that quite often. Sounds funny. It's really interesting, but, and this is sometimes, this point is done by the management, right? I know that from big enterprises where they use Java Desktop, and then the, the management guy comes to the development guy and said, um, you know what? Everybody's using uh, web, um, and I think we should do two. And then the developed guy, uh, uh, but why? Well, well, everybody does. I heard it in the management meeting, and they asked me why we don't use it. So please use web. So that's the design decision made, right? There was no requirement check. It's just we, we need to do, because everybody does. So what it should be is, it should be a requirement-driven development. So it means people should first understand the problem of the customer. That's the biggest thing, and it takes some time, and you have to take the time, really understand the problem if you understand the problem, then make a design decision, right? 
and then you solve the problem and not the way around, not make the design decision first. But this is really often, uh, that, that's really interesting that people are really doing that. It's not, a, I, I saw it very often in the, in the nearest past. So and what helps you doing that is something like, um, I, I just named it questionnaire matrix or whatever. So it can look like this is just, uh, just an example. <clears throat> to, to understand the problem, you just put some points in, the, in this matrix like um, license costs or uh, let's say real-time capability, operating um, or mobile client security or whatever. And then you have this very important, important and so on, unimportant. You just place the, the cross marks there. And then you have the web and desktop technology. And then you give points from minus four to four. You do that in a team. And then you just, in the end, you count the points. And then you make the decision. You say, okay, this time, this is better for web or this project we should use desktop, for example. And it's interesting, if you really do that and you are honest, sometimes you will figure out, hmm, a web application might not fit here. But if you do this hype-driven development, then you don't care, right? Because then the developers just try to make it happen. However, whatever it takes, we make it happen. And then you end up with something that works somehow, but it's not really the best solution. And that's why I'm really, um, trying to enforce people and first think about the problem and then make the decision and not really just do because everybody does. Or there is a new framework, which is so great. I saw the demo, it, it was awesome. We can do this and that and 3D. Oh, great, yeah. What, how should we use it in a bank? I don't know, we can switch tables or... It's really, you have these discussions and then it should look fancy. People are used to that on your phones to say, yeah, but these guys are just sitting in a bank and they have to work fast, right? So it's really, it's like expert applications. There you need different things. And uh, sometimes people forget that. Okay, um, let's go to some examples. Um, I mean, desktop, yeah. This is uh, something I'm working on right now. It's, this is an ongoing project at the moment. Um, and this is for a company that make, uh, they plan uh, ports for, for uh, container vessels. And for that, they also have to do, um, the vessels itself have to be defined. So that means what you see here is like a cross section through the vessel. And then um, here you can see how the container stuff is, is built on the, on the ship and all these things. This is just to give you an example of what you can do. You can also do that in a web application, I'm pretty sure, but this is just stuff I'm... And it doesn't look like a JavaFX application because we, what we do, we have a UI designer who creates a design and then we, we use the CSS to style it so that it really looks the way we would like to have it. This is my own little dashboard and I will show it to you later on because I use that on all different platforms. <clears throat> this is uh, stuff that I do a controls library. The interesting point now is mobile. If we take a look at glue on mobile, for example, then you can do things like that. This is for the um, Vox days. I don't know where. Um, ah, UK. Okay, or DevOx UK. They built a mobile application. This is now running on Android, but it also works on iOS where you have the, the content catalog and all these things. What we have here on this nice printed paper card, right? This thing is um, in principle this application. And you see you have uh, menus that can slide out and all these things and, and slide in. You can select, you have lists, you have swipe events and all that, like it's a mobile application. And you don't see this is JavaFX, right? But this is JavaFX. You can have 3D, like on the left side, it's also in JavaFX is capable of doing 3D. You have a map view. Again, this is my dashboard. You can see it also works on a mobile phone. Uh, this is, I think, on an iOS phone on the right side. Um, you can have games. You know this game, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And this one, if you take a look at the uh, 2048FX, you will find it in the Play Store. For the, for the Android phones. And this is a JavaFX application. This is completely written in JavaFX. There's no, and it's, it doesn't have an Android native frame or something. This is, this is an Android application written in JavaFX, and it could also be an iOS application, which is written in JavaFX and compiled to native iOS, because it's not allowed on iOS to really uh, deploy something 
bounded to a, a runtime environment. <clears throat> so what are the requirements to run something on a mobile phone, like Gluon Mobile? You download the IDE plugin, right, for IntelliJ NetBeans or Eclipse, and then you start a new project, and that's all. That's you need what you need to do. And then when you take a look at the project folder, you will see something like this, which is for me the best thing at all. Because what they do is you have a main folder, and in the main you have the Java resources and so on. And let's say you would like to do something special for desktop. You just override the, the stuff that you have in main in the desktop folder. There's again a Java and resources folder and so on. If you would like to have something special for iOS, you just do it in the iOS folder. And what you do there is plain JavaFX, means you can run that stuff on your desktop, test it with your normal things, and then you press deploy iOS, and it will create an iOS application. You say deploy Android, it will create a native Android application. You can deploy it to the App Store if you like. And the good thing is you can run the Android emulator, you can run the iOS simulator on your device, and it works. So you can run your application in there, you can test it, and it's just Java. There's nothing special about it. And the good thing is it's the same APIs. So that means if you would like to access, for example, the GPS sensor on the Android phone and on an iOS phone, it's just one API. You just get to the, I, I'm not sure how it's, uh, the, the exact name is, but it's like something like uh, Gluon location or GPS thing. And then it will directly, the Gluon libraries will take care on the iOS platform to access the right API and on the Android platform to access the right API, which makes it very easy to, to do. I mean, it can't really compete with native iOS and Android apps. I mean, speed-wise, it's on par, it's the same, but because in iOS you have different possibilities sometimes or on Android, you can't really use directly the, the Android APIs. That's not possible. So you are bound to the Gluon stuff, which more or less works for all of the things you would like to do, but you can't really do stuff like, oh, on Android I can, they have this special API, I would like to access it. Hmm, not that easy, right? <clears throat> this is made for cross-platform. You also see the embedded folder. You can also create code that runs on, let's say, a Raspberry Pi without any problem. And you can also build all the stuff with one build step. No problem at all. <clears throat> so let's take a look at web, because that's the most fascinating thing, I think. Uh, this is my, my dashboard, and it's running here in the browser. And um, this is an application that is, to be honest, it looks ugly to me. But that's what the customer would like to have it, OK? Um, not my problem. Uh, but yeah, hard to see the switches and all these things. But this is um, an application for a customer running in the browser. <clears throat> Another one, I think this is an insurance company. And the interesting part is the same application, and I mean the exact same thing, works on desktop. There's no difference in code, nothing. You just run it. And that's the fascinating part. Yeah, some more screenshots. I mean, it's, it's nothing fancy to show. The requirements to run JPro are quite easy. It's just a Maven or a Gradle task and a plugin. That's all. That's all you need to do, and then you can run it. And that's quite easy to do. And, and of course, you need to start it. Uh, you have to install it on the server which is if you have a multi-user application, you can, um, because you're, you can imagine it's a desktop application running in the web, means somewhere on the server, yeah, they have to run a JVM for this application. How do you handle sessions in one JVM? This doesn't really work. So what they do is they can deploy it to a cloud environment, and then you can spin up instances for each user that logs in, something like that, this is possible. And then you have, if you have a cloud instance that is pay per use, then it's really just the time the user uses the software. It will, you will have to pay for it. So let me show you some things. Um, first of all, oh yeah, I'm, oh, wrong screen. Uh, can I move it somewhere? Ah, here we go. May, might be hard to read, right? And, and now I can't really, oh, wait, this is bad. <clears throat> Give me a second. 
because I need to get my window back, otherwise I can't really... Yeah, but I will give you an impression. So I will start, start my, my desktop application here and move it to the main screen. Here we go. So this is the Java application, the dashboard that you saw. This is just started from the IDE, just my application. Now I have the same one on my desktop as a compiled native app. And I can start the same here. Where is it? There. So this is a native app running on, on Mac. Uh, you barely see the difference here because it's, it's really just, I think the frame has a, you can close it and all that, that's the difference. Now the interesting part is I started from the, let me see. <clears throat> I started from the IDE, I have to start the Gradle W JPro start. That means I start the server on my machine locally. It takes a couple of seconds. And then I will open it in the browser for you. And then you can see, all right, still starting. I mean, you can see how it starts, but it's not really interesting for you, I guess. And now I have to get the window back. Oh no, wait, I can just... It's running, okay, and then go to the browser. And now it loads, here you go, that's the load screen. And here we go. This is the same application, there's really no difference and I don't use any fancy code uh, in, my, um, in my application to make that work, it's just one Java application. And the interesting part is if I, this will switch on the light in my office, and if I press here, you see also in the other applications, in the native ones, they are all synced. So this is just the same stuff. In my office, I have some sensors. They measure this, these things and send it out via MQTT, and then all these applications are, are running on that. And it's, uh, this is the browser window. If I resize it, you see also the layout will change of that one. The same goes for the others. So if I go to the native app, and, and you can also do it like this, and that means if I have my iPad here, <coughs> then I can use it also on my iPad. Let's say this one. It loads from the browser. Unfortunately, I, uh, maybe if I hold it here somewhere, no, it's too bright. I'm not sure if you can see it, but here you see now this is the same one. And if I switch on here, the Office one, you see on the others it will also switch on. This is running on the web on my own server now. I have an own server where the stuff is deployed where I can also run it. You can do, you can interact with it. Yeah, usually I take some time, the internet connection not that fast. So you can uh, interact with this stuff. And if you rotate it, it will rotate. Okay, this is, this iPad is also quite old. But um, you can do things like that. I have it <coughs> natively running as a native app on my iPhone. Again, um, this is now using uh, JPro. Um, uh, sorry, Gluon, and this is the Gluon application running on my iPhone, the same thing, and it works also in both directions. So if I switch it on here, uh, then it should, you see on the other ones, it works also. So that means I can create code that runs on mobile platforms, on the web, on the desktop, all from one code base. It's exactly the same. There's no difference here with this code. It's just, I just have one main class. And the only thing that I do, I use different uh, build jobs to build it and plugins. And I think this is something which is, you have to take it into account if you create applications, because sometimes what we saw is we have customers, they have a desktop application. Then the management comes up with, yeah, I, I would like to have something on my iPad that I can show in a management meeting, some kind of dashboard. That's the reason why I show a dashboard. Um, and for these use cases, the JPro stuff makes sense because you, can, you just need a, a dashboard on an iPad. You can, he just opens a website, shows it to the management guys. He can interact with the existing software. That's no problem. You can create a special class that just uh, goes for the web view. So that means in the end, if you take it into account when you make decisions, uh, it won't die, hopefully. So, and that's, that's it for today. Thank you.